What's up, you guys? It's me, yay, again, with part two of chapter three. I realized towards the end of the first part that I said chapter four, which was, which I did mean to. <laughs> I was not thinking given that much. Uh, but anyways, let's get started. I need to move this. The summer he and his brother turned 15, his father had taken him for a long hike. When they were alone in the woods, the older Boyland had demanded to know if Gabriel was gay. Gay, not gay. Gabriel knew he was different from his brother and his father, but there were other guys like him, guys who wanted more than hitting a ball. And it had nothing to do with whether or not he liked girls. He'd said he wasn't and had known his father didn't believe him. On the right side, when Gideon got caught with a cheerleader in the back of the family car, he'd been grounded for a month. When Gabriel had been found with the pastor's daughter in, the very in a very compromising pos situation, he'd gotten a slap on the back and unexpected praise. So, there had been compensations, but on the whole, it hadn't been easy being his father's son. Now, all these years later, later, as he waited in the cold for his parents to arrive, Gabriel told himself there was no need to head for the hills, or in this case, the mountains. He might not have he might not have his brother's special forces training, but he figured he could make a run at surviving for a few weeks on his own. Not that disappearing that way was an option. They were all lined up on the porch, even Webster, who had no idea why the pack was shivering in the cold, but happy to be a part of things. An aging Ford Explorer pulled up in the in front of of the house and parked. Gabriel watched the couple that stepped out. His first thought was that they were older than he remembered. It had been years and the time showed, more on his father than his mother. His second thought was that his father seemed smaller somehow, not the imposing figure he'd always been. It wasn't easy to grow up with a drill sergeant for a father. There were expectations for behavior in the community that other kids didn't have. Norman Boylan, Boylan had always been more boogeyman than parent, at least when Gabriel had been young. Now looking at the man, he, relied, he realized that he was at least two inches taller. His father wasn't a threat anymore. He was little more than a man close to 60 who had been the center of his son's small world. Excuse me. Gabriel's mother, Karen, was still pretty. There had always been a softness to her, and he saw that now as she took in the sight of, her bo of both her boys. Then her gaze shifted to Carter, and tears filled her blue eyes. She'd been the one who comforted the one who tried to explain why their father had made the rules he had and enforced them with an iron fist. Gideon had accepted her hugs and kisses, then run off, healed. But Gabriel had resisted asking why instead of apologizing for their father. She didn't try to change him. He remembered she'd said changing a man wasn't so easy, and when he got older, he would understand. Felicia and Carter were the ones were the first ones down the stairs. Karen hugged her future daughter in law, then put her hands on Carter's shoulders. Webster joined them, racing to Norman's side. <sighs> Gabriel half expected his father to ignore the bounding puppy. Instead he crouched down and petted him, then ordered him to sit. Webster, like any young recruit, 
did what he was told. We'll go into town and get drunk, Gideon said as he and Gabriel started down the stairs. How about we get drunk in Morocco? Gideon flashed him a smile, then stepped into, onto the path and held out his hand to his father. Gabriel did the same. What they said was, Dad, but the tone was, Sir. Norman then tried to hug them. He studied each of them in turn, stepping back when their mother rushed toward them. My boys, she cried, holding out her arms to them and pulling them close. She hung for a long time. Gabriel gently patted her back, waiting for all the emotions to pass. Finally, she stepped away and wiped her tears. I can't believe how long it's been since we were all together, she said, her voice trembling. This is so wonderful. She turned to Felicia. Thank you for inviting us. We're happy to have you, Felicia murmured. Gabriel, wait. Gabriel waited. From what he'd seen, Felicia usually said more. A statement or two on the importance of it, the family unit or an unexpected observation about connection. But there was nothing else. Gideon leaned close. She's trying to tone things down for the folks. They're going to find out you're marrying a genius sooner or later. She wants it later so she doesn't scare them off. She's great. They'll like her. That's what I said, Gideon told him. But she won't listen. Gabriel wanted to take her aside and point out that Gideon wasn't looking for their approval, but doubted that would make her feel better. She would have to figure it out for herself. They moved into the house. Norman fell back to keep pace with Gabriel, still slacking off at it. the cushy hospital job, his father asked, slapping him on the back. Gabriel thought about the horrors he saw, the hours he worked, and how there was never an easy day. He remembered the countless times he'd been forced to tell a brave young soldier that, yes, his leg, his arm, eye, or more was gone. He thought of the screams and the blood and knew there was no point in talking about any of it. Still slacking off, he said, shutting the door behind him. Noel turned. Noel hurried toward Bruhaha. Excuse me. Her friends had invited her for coffee before she opened her store. While she was busy, she never thought to say no. Since moving to Fool's Gold, she met wonderful women who were very much a part of her life. They had sustained her in ways they didn't even know about. She walked in the coffee house right on time and saw that Patience, Felicia, and Isabel were already at the table together. There was a plate of muffins, a latte at each, end, at each place, and a slightly guilty expression on each of their faces. Noel had no idea what was up, but she was, but she knew the guilt didn't come from from eating an extra muffin. That morning, <clears throat> hi, she said as she took her seat. What's up? Patience slumped in her seat. I'm so bad at this. I just can't keep a secret. Not from anyone I care about. I'm a blabber. It doesn't matter if I don't say anything. It shows on my face. Felicia studied her. In the gambling world, it's called a tell, the twitch of a muscle or a nostril flare. I could show you what you're doing and teach you how to control your involuntary ac reaction. Or she could simply accept the fault and move on. Isabel said cheerfully she picked up her latte. I'm just saying. I don't think I'm very trainable, Patience admitted. Noel relaxed and reached for a muffin. Obviously, whatever was up with her friends wasn't a crisis. If you want to try, I'm here for you, Felicia said, then cleared her throat. Gideon's parents arrived last night.
I apologize. I had salt and vinegar chips. So, my taste buds are... My taste buds in the roof of my mouth are just odd. And drinking doesn't really help much. Back to the story. Um, they weren't due for a couple of days, Isabel said. Or did I get that wrong? They were early, Felicia admitted. Noel thought about Gabriel and how tired he'd been yesterday. She didn't know the man very well, but from the little she'd seen, he wasn't exactly a family kind of guy. Did everything go okay? She asked. It was awkward, Felicia admitted. Norman and Karen seem very nice, but there hasn't been much connection between all of them in a while. So that makes a difficult situation worse. Carter's thrilled and Webster offers an excellent distraction. We talked for a couple of hours and we all went to bed. She held on her mug. This morning, Norman was up and fixing breakfast at six. I found him easy to talk to, but I don't have any kind of past with him. It's going to be more difficult for Gideon and his brother. Can we help, Patience asked. Who's to dinner or something? Isabel nodded. Ford is a master at dealing with a big family. And we can all be buffers. Just say the word. Noelle nodded, not wanting to say anything in case she sounded too eager. Because where there were Felicia's soon-to-be in-laws, there was also likely to be a certain handsome doctor. Maybe he would like her. Maybe he would like her to rub his back or gaze adoringly into his eyes. She was up for either, or something more adult, which only went to show she had been manless for far too long. Thank you, Felicia said. I appreciate the show of friendship. She pressed her lips together. Enough about me. We wanted to talk to Noel for a reason, and she has to be at her store soon. The three women turned to her. Noel had study, had a sudden need to worry about having something stuck in her teeth. What? Don't freak me out. This is my busy period. I couldn't take the pressure. Patience reached for her hand. We have something to tell you. It's a good thing, Isabel added quickly. Then sighed. The best. We're getting married, Felicia added. Noelle exhaled a breath she hadn't realized she was holding. She squeezed Patience's fingers, then picked up her latte. Duh, you're all wearing engagement rings. I'm blinded on a regular basis. It was true. Each of them sported a diamond ring of impressive size. Noelle resisted the urge to cover her face and moan, My eyes! My eyes! But she wasn't sure her friends would get the humor. You know I'm happy for each of you, right? She sipped. Do you worry I'm upset? No, Isabel told her. It's not that at all. Then we're getting married at Christmas, Patience said in a rush. Christmas Eve after the dance of the Winter King. Oh, wow, that's great. Noelle had never seen the dance of the Winter King, but she'd heard all about it. Fool's Gold did Christmas in style. Christmas Eve day began with a live nativity and ended with the production put on by the local ballet school. Afterward, those attending went to midnight services at the various churches around town. We haven't told anyone, Felicia added. Our fiancés know, of course, and Delina... She's assisting us in planning the weddings. We thought with having everyone already at the convention center, it would be convenient. Isabel rolled her eyes and romantic. It will be a surprise. But we wanted you to know, Patience added. Thanks for telling me this is a great idea. I can't wait. Noah felt a slight twinge and knew that was about... Wanting to be in love herself.
And while she was totally happy for her friends, she wanted a little of that love magic. Two. It would happen, she told herself firmly. She only had to believe. She knew that life was a precious gift. And she was going to enjoy all of it, including her friends' triple wedding. We want you to be our attendant, Felicia told her. Isabel grinned. Look at it this way. You only have to buy one hideous dress. She held up her hands. And it won't be hideous, I promise. I've already pulled three different dresses that are great. I'm honored, Noelle said sincerely, for all of you thinking of me. This is going to be such a surprise for everyone. Let me know if you need any help with anything. You're extremely busy with your sword, Felicia pointed out. But your offer of assistance is very supportive. Thank you. She smiled. Consuelo also offered to help, but I knew she didn't mean it. She was backing out of the door as she said it. The smile broadened. Broadened. Maybe I'll invite her to be a bridesmaid. Patience's eyes widened. Are they to that point? Isabel shook her head. I'm sure Kent will propose in a heartbeat. But Consuelo needs a little more time to settle into what she calls the hell of being normal. Noelle chuckled. That sounds like her. She glanced at the time on her cell phone and groaned. I have to get the store open. Thanks for telling me your secret. I'll keep it to myself and thank you for making my first ever fool's gold Christmas even more special. Noelle waved as she dashed out and headed for her store. She was pleased to find she really was genuinely happy for her friends. They were all in love with terrific men, men she had absolutely no interest in. She told herself that what she would take from the upcoming wedding was that love was in the air, and if she was lucky, she would catch a little of it herself. She turned on 4th Street and raced toward her store. She still had to restock the stack, the stack of throws she kept by the stuffed animals. They had been a last-minute addition to her inventory and were huge sellers. Apparently, Christmas was when everyone wanted an extra blanket or two to toss on the sofa. She was reaching for her keys when she saw someone standing outside of her store. Excuse me, a tall, handsome someone with piercing blue eyes. Excuse me, and a smile that made her stomach start the macarena. <laughs> What are you doing? She asked Gabriel. She asked Gabriel as she approached. Did you decide you really need a nativity made out of local gourds? Gabriel stared at her. You have one of those? Of course. I pride myself on stocking the unusual. Or the extremely strange. It's Christmas, she pointed out. Or it will be in six weeks. When else would someone want a gourd-based nativity? As she spoke, she opened the front door and flipped on the lights. He followed her inside. She turned on the trains, then started the music. She was unwinding her scarf when she shifted back to find him standing in the middle of the store. He looked better than he had. More rested, less gray. Although he still seemed tired, the shadows remained... In residence beneath his eyes. What's up? She asked, shrugging out of her coat. I want to talk to you about a job. She laughed. Right. If you're looking for a present for your mom, I can give you some suggestions. We have some really pretty ornaments she might like. She disappeared into the back to put her coat away and tuck her handbag into her desk's bottom drawer. When she straightened, Gabriel was standing close enough that she could see the various colors of blue that made up his irises. She could inhale the clean scent of him and catch a hint of the heat the man generated. I want to come work for you, he said. That's insane. You're a doctor. This is retail. 
I sell Christmas stuff. I know what you do. You need help, and I need... She waited, confident that the... Confident this had to be a joke. When he didn't speak, she shook her head. I'm sure they would be thrilled to have you volunteer services at the local hospital. I need a break from that. You're looking for someone to stock shelves and work the cash register. I can do that. You're injured. Just my left hand. I'm right-handed. She put her hands on her hips. What's going on? Are you filming this for a YouTube video? Famous Dr. Punk's innocent store owner. I'm not eating a live bug for you. No live bugs. Not a dead one either. Why can't I apply for the job? Because you're grossly overqualified. She touched his arm. What is this about? <clears throat> she asked. She asked again. He drew in her breath <clears throat> and stared into her eyes. Yes, I know my voice is cracking. <clears throat> you try doing this every day for 25 days and maybe even a whole month of this of reading Christmas stories. <clears throat> However, however long I can continue finding Christmas stories. Um, anyways, back to the story. Um, he drew in a breath and stared into her eyes. I need to be doing something with my dad. I'm stuck here for over a month and I have nothing to do. I can't work in a hospital right now. He opened his mouth, then closed it. I can't. Noelle hated to admit she didn't know all that much about the wars her country had been fighting for. Fighting for over a decade. She saw what was on the news and those special reports on the magazine shows. But that was it. Her only first-hand knowledge came from what she'd learned from the men her friends had gotten involved with. This past year, a bodyguard school had opened in town. The principals were all highly trained former military people who risked their lives to protect those at home. Isabel's fiancé, Ford, had been a SEAL. Consuelo had served and done ser secret service stuff. Had done secret stuff. Oops. Gideon had been in the army and so on. She'd heard bits and pieces, knew there were ghosts and nightmares and the kind of damage that wouldn't always be seen. It made sense those hoping the injured would suffer in their own way. I'm going to make a series of statements, she said slowly. I'd like you to respond to them. <coughs> Excuse me? Now you sound like Felicia. I should be so lucky. She drew in a breath. You're in town because of your hand and maybe what you do for a living. It's something you need a break from. He nodded cautiously. She hesitated, feeling her way through an emotional minefield. You don't see your family, family very much. Another nod? So, being around them is intense and parents aren't are inherently complicated. Plus, there's the whole, they don't know Carter, and what do they want from you? Another, uh, nod? My amazingly charming story has a good emotional vibration, and you feel comfortable here. Plus, you're really excited about the Gord nativity. Did you know they're made by a guy named Lars, a local farrier? Who also trims Heidi's goat's, goat's hooves? His mouth curved up. Now you're making stuff up. I'm not. She paused. You really want to stock my shelves and ring up my purchases? Noelle had the. Noelle had to press her lips together as she wondered why a perfectly normal question suddenly sounded incredibly dirty. It would be the highlight of my holiday season. I can't pay much more than minimum wage. Not a problem. Even though you don't need this job, I have to be able to depend on you. I promise not to go snowboarding without clearing it with you first, but the day after Christmas, I'm gone. Excuse me. My busy season ends the day before Christmas. 
so we don't have, so we don't seem to have timing issue. Have, excuse me, a timing issue. She hesitated, sure, there was something she was missing. Only she couldn't figure out what it was. The bottom line was she needed help, and a responsible, attractive man was offering. She couldn't think of a single reason to say no. Okay then, I guess you're hired. And that does it with chapter four. I will probably read chapter four to, um, for tomorrow. So, I hope you guys enjoyed part two of chapter three. I was a bit lazy, and the conversion time takes so long, because these are like 30, maybe 40, sometimes almost 50 minutes long. Um, but I really do hope you enjoyed the series, this series. I really, really do love this book. And I'm still reading one of my other books. Uh, so if you really like this video, please give it up and subscribe. I'm making almost a lot of videos for the month of Christ, uh, for the month of December, not Christmas.